welcome back uh, this lecture is a continuation of my earlier lecture and the specific objectives of this particular lecture are to introduce solar radiation through fenestration define solar heat gain factor and shading coefficient discuss effects of external shading introduce ventilation and infiltration and discuss estimation of heating and cooling loads due to ventilation and infiltration so at the end of the lecture you should be able to estimate heat transmitted into a building due to solar radiation through fenestration using values of solar heat gain factor and shading coefficient from tables calculate dimensions of the overhangs for external shading explain the importance of ventilation and estimate heating and cooling loads due to ventilation and infiltration before that let me just work out an example on uh, calculation of solar radiation on a south facing wall the example is like this you have to calculate the total solar radiation incident on a south facing vertical surface at solar noon on june 21st and december 21st using the data given below the latitude angle is given to be 23 degrees centigrade and the hour angle is uh, 0 degrees because it is at solar noon okay this is not given but you have to infer this from the given information and the declination declination is plus 23.5 degrees on june 21st and minus 23.5 degrees on december 21st and the tilt angle tilt angle here is 90 degrees because it's a vertical surface and the wall azimuth angle zeta is 0 degree centigrade because the wall is south facing and finally it is given that the reflectivity of the ground is 0 0.6 so this is the information given uh, and based on this we will have to calculate the total solar radiation okay so here uh, a stepwise procedure is shown first what we do is we find out the altitude angle beta uh, since uh, we are doing the calculations at solar noon the beta is nothing but beta max that is given by pi by 2 minus absolute value of l minus d where l is the latitude and d is the declination so you find that the altitude angle works out to be 89.53 degrees degrees first time doing the calculation for june 21st okay so here i take the declination as 23.5 degrees next at solar noon we have to calculate what is the solar azimuth angle since uh, we are calculating making the calculations at solar noon the solar azimuth angle is either uh, 180 degrees or 0 degrees it is 0 degrees if latitude is less than declination so you have to take solar azimuth angle to be 0 degrees in this case okay and uh, next we have to calculate what is so wall solar azimuth angle alpha the wall solar azimuth angle alpha is given by 180 minus uh, gamma plus zeta and here you find that uh, gamma is 0 and zeta is also 0 so you find that the value of alpha is 180 degrees for this particular case okay once you know the value of alpha and the value of beta we can calculate the incidence angle since this is a vertical wall the incidence angle is given by theta vertical is cos inverse cos beta into cos alpha beta is 89.53 degrees and alpha is 180 degrees so from this you find that the incidence angle is 89.53 degrees once you know the incident angle we can calculate what is the direct radiation on the surface the direct radiation is given by idn cos theta so first let us find out idn from the ashray model idn is given by a multiplied by exponential within bracket minus b by sin beta where beta is altitude angle that is 89.53 degrees and a is uh, 1080 for uh, summer so you take the value of a as 1080 and b which is called as the extinction coefficient it takes a value of 0.21 for summer this, these aspects I have discussed in the last lecture okay so you uh, take these values of 1080 for a and the 0.21 for b and substitute the value of beta you find that the direct normal radiation is 875.4 watt per meter square so we have to find out what is the direct radiation on the vertical surface so that uh, you have to find out by multiplying this with cos theta where theta is the angle of incident okay that is the 89.53 degrees so if you find that you will find that uh, idn cos theta the works out to be 7.18 watt per meter square okay next we have to find out the diffuse radiation uh, diffuse radiation for, for that we have to find out uh, the view factor view factor is given by 1 plus cos uh, uh, epsilon by 2 and uh, this is 90 degrees so you find that view factor is 0.5 okay this is for the diffuse radiation 
Once you know the view factor, diffusion radiation given by again based on the Asher model, I d is equal to C into I subscript d n into F subscript w s, where t c takes a value of 0 0.135 for summer. Since I am making the calculations for uh, June, I take a value of 0 0.135 and I d n we were works out to be 875.4 uh, as shown in the last slide and F w s is 0.5. So, if substitute all these values, you find that the diffuse radiation is 59.1 watt per meter square. Next, we have to find out the reflected radiation. Reflected radiation also has a view factor between the ground and the wall. So, first let us find the view factor between the ground and the wall that is F subscript W z this one that is given by 1 minus cos epsilon by 2. So, this works out to be 0 0.5. Then, based on the Asher model, the reflected radiation from the ground is equal to I d n plus I diffuse multiplied by rho z into F w z where rho z is the reflectivity of the ground which is given as 0 0.6 and F w z is 0 0.5. So, if you substitute the value of I d n and I diffuse you find that the reflected radiation works out to be 280.36 mat per meter square. So, the total incident radiation is nothing but sum total of direct uh, radiation contribution, diffuse radiation and reflected radiation. So, the direct radiation total radiation works out to be 346.64 watt per meter square. Okay, so, this is a fairly straightforward uh, procedure. This is for a vertical wall. If the surface is inclined, then you have to use the tilt angle and if it is facing any other direction other than uh, south, then you have to use proper uh, surface azimuth angle okay, as explained in the last lecture. In the same uh, manner, you can calculate uh, the all these parameters for December 21st. Okay. For December 21st, the declination angle will be minus 23.5 degrees. Okay. So, now let, let me show a table where, where the solar radiation results for June 21st and December 21st are given. So, this table shows the comparison between June 21st and December 21st. June 21st, you find that the incidence angle is 89.53, whereas for December 21st, it is 43.53. The direct radiation IDN is 875.4 watt per meter square in case of uh, June 21st and it is 1003.75 in case of December. Similarly, the contribution of direct radiation is nothing but IDN cos theta uh, is 7.18 watt per meter square for June and 727.7 watt per meter square for December. Okay, and the diffuse radiation is 59.1 and 29.1 and reflected radiation is 280.36 and 39.9 in case of December. So, the total incident radiation on the vertical surface is 346.64 watt per meter square on June 21st and 1066.7 watt per meter square on December 21st. Okay. This uh, example actually gives us some useful information. That information is that uh, this is a south facing wall. You observe here that for south facing wall, uh, if you, uh, you get uh, the total radiation incident on the wall is 346.64 watt per meter square in summer, whereas it is uh, almost 1100 watt per meter square in winter. Okay. And uh, here uh, for summer, uh, this value is coming because of the uh, reflected radiation, because we have taken 0 0.6 as the uh, reflectivity of the ground. If the ground is not so reflective, you find that uh, the total incident radiation on the vertical surface on June will be very small, whereas it is very high on the on December 21st or that is in winter. Okay. So, this tells us, uh, uh, this gives us an important information that is that uh, for south facing uh, walls, the solar radiation incident on a vertical surface uh, is much less in June whereas it is much higher in winter. Okay. So, if, since we want to reduce the load, heat load on the building during summer and we want to maximize the heat transfer to the building during uh, winter. Uh, it is always beneficial to keep uh, windows, doors, etc. on uh, south side, okay, so that uh, the radiation part will be small in uh, summer and it will be large in winter. So, your cooling uh, capacity requirement will be small and the heating capacity requirement also will be small. Okay. So, this is actually, this is a principle generally used in passive cooling and heating techniques. Okay. Use the south wall properly. And of course, these results hold good for uh, northern hemisphere, okay, because uh, the latitude is 23 degree north. The results will be different if we are talking about southern hemisphere. Okay. And uh, so far, uh, this ASHRAE model, in fact, if you remember, I have mentioned in the last class that uh, this uh, model assumes that the sky is uh, cloudless. Okay. But if the sky is cloudy, sometimes what is done is a clearness index value is used to calculate the incident direct 
solar radiation. Okay. The clearness index value is 1 if the sky is uh, clear and it will be less than 1 if the sky is cloudy. Okay. And the clearness index value for different uh, reasons uh, during different seasons uh, are available. Okay. So, from that data you can calculate what is the radiation uh, during a cloudy uh, day. Okay. Now, uh, ne next let us look at uh, solar radiation through fenestration. First of all, what is fenestration? Fenestration refers to any glazed apertures in a building such as glass doors, windows, skylights, etc. That means, it refers to all those transparent surfaces uh, such as uh, uh, doors, windows, skylights, etc. Okay. All these are uh, called as fenestration. We need fenestration, uh, all buildings have fenestration. Why do we need fenestration? It is required because it provides uh, daylight, heat and outside air and uh, fenestration also provides visual communication to the outside world. It also improves aesthetics and finally, it provides an escape route in case of fires in low rise buildings. Because of all these factors, almost all buildings will have some amount of fenestration. That means, you will have some amount of glass windows or glass doors, etcetera, okay, because of the uh, four reasons uh, mentioned here. Now, let us see what is the effect of this uh, on the co cooling and heating loads. Heat transfer due to solar radiation through transparent surfaces is distinctly different from heat transfer through opaque surfaces. This is one important thing uh, to uh, note. Okay. What is the difference? Radiation incident on an opaque surface, for example, a wall or a roof is partly absorbed and uh, the remaining is reflected back because it is opaque surface, so its transmittivity is 0. So, whatever radiation is incident, either it is absorbed or it is reflected. That means, it is partly absorbed and partly reflected. And out of the absorbed part, only a fraction of it is transferred into the building. This aspect we will discuss in the next lecture. So, ultimately, whenever radiation is incident on an opaque building, uh, uh, some of it is absorbed and some of it is reflected back. And out of the absorbed portion, only a part is finally transferred to the building. That means, only a part of the radiation incident on an opaque surface finally becomes a load on the building. Okay. Uh, this is as far as the opaque surface is concerned. Now, let us look at a transparent surface. For a transparent surface, uh, a major part of the radiation incident on a transparent surface is directly transmitted into the building while the rest is absorbed and reflected back. We know for this from our basic physics that all transparent surfaces have high transmittivity. Okay. So, whenever radiation is incident on the surface, most of it is trans transmitted through the surface, right? transmitted through the glass and only a small part of it is absorbed and a small part of it is reflected back. So, this is the major difference between the transparent surface and opaque surface and this has uh, a huge effect on the heating and cooling loads. Okay. First, let me uh, let us look at a reference uh, surface and see what happens to the radiation. Okay. This is a distribution of solar radiation on a clear plate glass okay. or a clear plate glass. Clear plate glass has these uh, optical properties. It has a transmittivity of 0 0.8, it has an absorptivity of 0 0.12, it has a reflectivity of 0 0.08. Okay. So, these are the values for the solar radiation. For solar radiation, these are the values. Now, uh, since it has a transmittivity of 0 0.8, if 100 percent of uh, solar radiation is incident on this window, okay, which is nothing but your uh, window made of clear plate glass, plate glass, 80 percent of it is directly transmitted to the indoors, okay, because it has a transmittivity of 0 0.8. Right? And uh, 12 percent of it is absorbed by the glass while 8 percent of it is reflected back. Okay. This is based on the optical properties of the clear glass. Now, of, of the 12 percent absorbed, what happens to this 12 percent of the radiation absorbed by the glass? This will increase the temperature of the glass. That means, uh, glass temperature increases due to absorption, okay. absorption of radiation. Right. So, once the glass temperature increases, it rejects some heat by convection to the outside and some part of it is rejected to the indoors. Okay. So, for example, uh, typical values are uh, this particular glass will uh, reject about 8 percent to the outside and about 4 percent to the indoors. So, finally, you see that out of the 100 percent uh, solar radiation incident on the surface, 80 percent plus 4 percent that is 84 percent is directly transmitted to the 
um, uh, building or to the indoors while 16 percent is transmitted to the outside. Okay. This is uh, for a clear plate glass and these values will be different for uh, different types of glasses. Okay. Now, what is the importance of uh, fenestration and glaze surfaces? Why do we have to um, consider this seriously? Fenestration or glaze surfaces contribute a major part of cooling load of a building. Okay. So, uh, the energy transfer due to fenestration depends on the characteristics of the surface and its orientation, weather and solar radiation conditions. So, careful design of fenestration can reduce the building energy consumption considerably. Okay, so, if you are, uh, if you design it properly, then uh, fenestration can help you in reducing the uh, initial and running cost. But if you do not design it properly, then you will have to pay both in terms of initial and running cost. For example, if you design the uh, fenestration properly, that means if you put the glass windows, doors, etc., uh, properly on proper direction and uh, with a proper orientation, you will find that uh, the radiation transmitted to the building during summer can be reduced very much whereas it can be increased uh, very much in winter. As a result, the cooling load on the building can be reduced during summer and the heating load on the building can be reduced in winter. Okay. So, the required cooling and heating uh, capacities will be less. So, your initial and running cost will be less. Okay. So, if you are that is if you are using the uh, fenestration properly. Okay. Instead of that, if you are putting glass left and right uh, just to uh, increase the aesthetics or anything, you will find that both heating as well as cooling loads will increase. Okay, so, ultimately you will have to pay for this in terms of initial and running costs. Okay. So, uh, that is why it is very important to understand the importance of fenestration and the issues involved in the design of fenestration for buildings. Now, let us look at a simple model for calculating solar radiation passing through a transparent surface. Okay. So, this model is based on these assumptions. Now, the assumptions are like this. Uh, so, this is valid uh, under the assumption that the transmittivity that is the tau value and absorptivity that is alpha value of the fenestration is same for both direct as well as diffuse radiation. This is an important uh, point to be remembered. In actual case, you find that the transmittivity and uh, absorptivity of the glass will be different for direct radiation and diffuse radiation. Okay, The values will be different. And the transmittivity and absorptivity values of direct radiation, okay, it depends strongly on the angle of incidence. right? So, this is again a very important uh, point to be uh, remembered. The transmittivity and absorptivity of the glass for direct radiation is not a constant. Okay, So, it is a function of the angle of incidence. And as we have seen, the angle of incidence itself varies. It varies with the latitude, it varies with the hour angle, it varies with the declination and with the orientation, etcetera. Right. So, the based on this, the transmittivity and absorptivity of the glass also varies, whereas the transmittivity and uh, absorptivity of the diffuse radiation remains more or less constant. Okay. However, the model that I am going to present, uh, which is taken actually from ASHRAE uh, handbooks, it is based on the assumption that the transmittivity and absorptivity values are same, are constant and they are same for both uh, direct radiation as well as diffuse radiation. However, uh, this assumption is justified because normally we do the calculations for the peak uh, load conditions. Okay. And at peak load conditions, you find that the contribution of direct radi radiation is much larger compared to the direct, uh, direct uh, diffuse radiation, I am sorry. So, direct radiation is much larger than the diffuse radiation. Uh, so, the, if you are assuming that uh, the tau values and alpha values are same for both, uh, you would not be making a huge error okay. and besides it uh, simplifies the uh, procedure. However, it is not necessary that you have to assume them to be same. Okay, uh, with a little bit of extension, you can take different values of tau and alpha for uh, diffuse radiation and uh, direct radiation and do the calculation separately. Okay. So, under this assumption, you can write uh, the solar radiation transmitted to the building Q subscript S G. Okay, is equal to A, uh, which in uh, multiplied by within brackets tau into I subscript T plus N multiplied by alpha multiplied by I subscript T. Here, uh, as I said Q S Z okay, is the radiation transmitted to the building and the units are watts in SI units. Okay. And A is the area of the surface exposed to radiation in meter square. I T is the total radiation incident on the surface. So, this includes both uh, direct plus diffuse 
Okay. Of course, you can also include uh, reflected radiation. Normally, reflected radiation will be a small part. So, this includes the total radiation incident on the surface and tau is as you know is the transmittivity of the glass, alpha is the absorptivity of the glass. And what is n? n is a new parameter and this is the fraction of absorbed radiation transferred to the indoors uh, by conduction and convection. In fact, I was uh, mentioning that uh, when the glass absorbs radiation, its temperature increases. So, because of the temperature difference between the glass and the surroundings, there will be heat transfer due to convection. Okay. So, this factor n uh, takes into account this heat transfer, that means the heat transfer due to convection because of the temperature difference between the glass and the surrounding air. Okay. And it can be very easily shown that at steady state, the value of n is given by u divided by h naught, where u is the overall heat transfer coefficient. Okay, and H naught is the external heat transfer coefficient. So, u is the overall heat transfer coefficient for a, for a flat glass 1 by u, you know that uh, the expression 1 by u is 1 by H i plus 1 by H naught plus uh, delta x by k wall. Okay, this is the resistance of the wall, this is the convective resistance uh, on the outside, this is the convective resistance of the inside. Okay, so, you can calculate uh, overall heat transfer coefficient and H naught is the external heat transfer coefficient. Okay, so, if you know the overall heat transfer coefficient, external heat transfer coefficient, properties of the glass and if you can estimate the total radiation incident on the surface as we have uh, shown in the example, last example, you can calculate what is the solar energy transmitted to the building. Okay through fenestration. Now, uh, what we can do is uh, from the last expression, we can write Q S Z uh, like this. Okay. A and uh, take out A and you can also take out uh, I T. So, you can write Q S Z is A into within brackets I T multiplied by within bracket tau plus alpha u by H naught. As I said, tau is the transmittivity, alpha is the absorptivity u by h naught is your fraction n. Okay. Now, uh, what is done is uh, a single sheet clear window glass, okay. a single sheet clear window glass is taken as a reference and a factor called solar heat gain factor or SHGF is defined as follows. Okay. So, taking the uh, single sheet clear window glass as a reference, we define a solar heat gain factor as this, this is nothing but uh, total radiation incident on the surface multiplied by within brackets tau plus alpha u by h naught. Okay. And the subscript stands for subscript SS stands for single, uh, single sheet clear window glass that means it is for the reference glass. Okay. You will see uh, uh, immediately what is the advantage of defining this. The advantage is that the maximum uh, solar heat gain factor values for different latitudes months and orientations have been found and tabulated. For example, Asher handbooks gives the maximum uh, solar heat gain factors uh, for uh, different latitudes, months and orientations, etcetera. So, once you know the solar heat gain factor, uh, maximum solar heat gain factor uh, from the table uh, for a given latitude, for a given orientation, for a given uh, day, then you can calculate what is the energy transmitted into the uh, building if the um, uh, glass is made of reference glass because the, the energy transmitted is nothing but area multiplied by SHGF. Right? So, let me show you a typical uh, table uh, adopted from ASHA handbooks. Okay, so, this is the, this table gives maximum solar heat gain factor for sunlit glass okay, located at 32 degrees north uh, latitude and the units here are watt per meter square. Okay. For example, uh, for month uh, December. Okay. Uh, orientation of the surface, if the uh, window is facing north or window is shaded, then you find that this maximum solar heat gain factor is 69 watt per meter square in December, it is 75 watt per meter square during January and November, it is 85 uh, during February and October and 100 during March and September like that. Similarly, for northeast and northwest, that means the window is facing northeast or northwest direction. Then during December, this is the value, during January and November, this is the value, February, this is the value like that. Okay. Like that, uh, it gives uh, the solar heat gain factor, maximum solar heat gain factor for all orientations, for different orientations, okay. the eight uh, orientations and also for horizontal uh, orientation. For all these, uh, we are assuming that the um, uh, glass is vertical, okay. that means the tilt angle is 90 degrees, okay. so that means on a vertical wall. right? 
and uh, this data is valid for 32 degrees north latitude. ASHA handbook gives uh, this uh, similar data for other latitude also for example 24 degrees, 40 degrees like that. Right. So, from this uh, table uh, you can calculate what is the so maximum solar heat gain factor. For example, I would like to find out uh, during the month of July, I want to find out what is the solar heat gain factor uh, through a south facing uh, window, okay. that value is given by 230. Right. During a east or west facing window it is 685, like that we can find out the uh, SHGF maximum. Uh, one interesting thing uh, you, uh, you can observe here uh, is the benefit of putting uh, the window on the south side as I was mentioning in the last example. You can see that uh, for south side windows, uh, okay, the maximum solar heat gain factor that means uh, radiation transmitted into the building because of uh, solar radiation through the glass is very small during summer whereas it is large during winter. Okay. What we want is we would like to heat the buildings in winter using solar radiation okay. and we do not want any solar radiation into the building during summer right? because uh, that way you can keep the building cooler during uh, summer and you can keep the building warmer during the winter. So, using the solar radiation right. So, this is very beneficial and this is very beneficial only when you put the windows on the south side because you see that for the south side uh, there is practically not much radiation during summer whereas there is lot of radiation during winter. Okay. Whereas, for other directions like east west you find that it is almost same during uh, throughout the year. So, you should not put uh, you look at the table for east west the solar radiation is almost uh, constant throughout the year okay. maybe some 20 30 percent variation is there. That means, you should never keep windows on east or west direction because on east or west directions during summer you will receive lot of uh, radiation. Of course, during winter also you receive radiation, but not as much as you receive if you put the window on the south side. Okay. So, this kind of handbook uh, data uh, are available in the handbooks. Now, this data is for uh, a standard uh, reference glass. How about other glasses? For fenestrations other than the reference uh, SS glass, a shading coefficient is defined. Okay. This shading coefficient is defined such that the heat transfer due to solar radiation is given by QSZ that is equal to uh, area A okay, multiplied by SHGF maximum of the standard glass multiplied by the shading coefficient. So, finally, you find that shading coefficient is nothing but uh, the heat transmitted uh, uh, through the actual glass divided by the heat transmitted through a standard glass okay, that is how the shading coefficient is defined. And the shading coefficient depends upon the type of the glass and also on the type of the internal shading devices. Okay. You can use a wide variety of internal shading devices as you know very well uh, if you want to shade the uh, window from radiation you can use curtains, you can use Venetian blinds, roller, rollers uh, like that. Okay. So, the shading coefficient depends upon what kind of uh, internal uh, shading device you are using and it also depends upon what kind of glass you are using whether it is a double glass or a single glass etcetera. Okay. And typical values of shading coefficient for different types of glass with different types of internal shading devices have been measured and are tabulated for example, in ASHRAE handbooks. Okay. So, let me show a typical uh, table. Again, this is uh, taken from uh, ASHRAE handbooks. This table gives a shading coefficient for different types of glass and internal shading. Uh, for example, for a type of glass for a single glass, okay, uh, single sheet regular glass, this is the standard glass. If it has a thickness of 3 mm and if it does not have no internal shading, the shading coefficient is 1. The shading coefficient is 1 because this glass is taken as the reference. Okay. So, for this glass uh, the Q is simply A into SHGF maximum that you get from the table. right? Uh, however, if you are using uh, internal, shade, uh, internal sh uh, shading device for example, if you are using Venetian blinds uh, and uh, the Venetian blinds are of medium type you find that the shading coefficient reduces to 0 0.64 and if you are using light Venetian blinds then the shading coefficient becomes 0 0.55. If you are using roller shades and dark roller shades shading coefficient is 0.59, if it is light roller roller shade it is 0.25. This is for a single glass. Similarly, for different types of glass for example, if you are using a double glass a regular double glass of 3 mm uh, thickness you find that without internal shading uh, the shading coefficient is 0.9 whereas, for the single glass it is 1 
and with the internal shading these are the values right. Other types of glasses are you can also have heat absorbing glass of 6 mm thickness you find that for heat absorbing glass for 6 mm thickness the shading coefficient without internal shading is 0 0.7 that means 30 percent less compared to a regular glass okay. So that is how if you have this kind of uh, information uh, then you can uh, select the proper uh, shading coefficient value from these tables and once you know the shading coefficient value you can calculate what is the uh, heat transmitted into the building through this glass okay. Now heat transferred through the glass due to solar radiation can be reduced considerably using suitable internal shadings okay. You might have noticed that when you are using internal shadings the shading coefficient is less than 1 okay that means uh, amount of heat transmitted is less than 1 okay. So with this we know everybody knows that if you want to reduce the radiation you can simply put a curtain or you can simply use a Venetian blinds okay. So thereby you can cut down uh, the amount of radiation enter, uh, entering into the building okay. So that is good as far as the uh, cooling load is concerned. Of course, there is a negative aspect to this when you are using a dark curtain or uh, Venetian blinds etc. The light that is entering into the building also gets reduced okay. If uh, light is not sufficient then you may have to use uh, some artificial lighting right. So, you have to pay for the artificial lighting. So, again you have to uh, see the balance you have to balance between the requirement for the light and requirement for or uh, the requirement for reduction in the cooling load okay. And uh, from the type of the sunlit glass, its location and orientation and the type of internal shading, one can calculate the maximum heat transfer rate due to solar radiation. Let me give a, a small example, this is a very simple example. We have to calculate the maximum heat transfer rate through a 1.5 meter square area unshaded regular double glass facing south during June and December without and with internal shading. Okay. The internal shading is light Venetian blinds and the location is 32 degrees north, right. So, the data given is uh, we have to calculate uh, during uh, June and December, okay. So, first uh, let us do the calculation for June. For the month of June, the FSGF max from table is 190 watt per meter square, okay. So, this is the uh, uh, solar heat gain factor for the standard glass. Okay. Then using the values of shading coefficient from the table that uh, heat transfer rate is given by uh, this is the expression Q is A into FSGF max into shading coefficient. If you are not using uh, any shading coefficient any internal shading sorry uh, then uh, you find that area is 1.5 meter square and FSGF max is 190 watt per meter square and shading coefficient for the double glass is 0.9 from the table. So, you find that QSG is 256.5 watt on uh, June okay and with internal shading that means if you are using a Venetian blinds then for the same date right uh, you find that the maximum uh, energy transmitted is again given by the same formula area is same uh, SHGF max is also same but the shading coefficient is different now it is 0.51. Okay. So, you find that the total uh, or the rate at which energy is being transmitted, the maximum uh, transmission rate is given by 145.35 watt. So, from these you can see that uh, with uh, Venetian blinds you can reduce the energy transmitted considerably. It is almost 50 percent compared to without uh, internal shading. And if you do the same thing for December, okay, so you find that the SHGF max for December is 795 watt per meter square. So, without internal shading uh, QSG is 1073.25 watts with internal shading uh, this is 608.175 watt okay. Again you can see here that because this is a south facing glass the uh, energy transmitted during summer is much less whereas it is much higher during winter. Of course obviously during winter you should not use any internal shading because you want this whereas during summer you should use internal shading because you do not want this okay. Now, let us look at effect of external shading. So far uh, we have been uh, assuming that the window uh, is not shaded externally that means the full area of the window is exposed to radiation. Okay. 
but uh, most of the times we find that uh, uh, most of the windows will have some kind of an external shading okay for example an overhang right this overhang provides uh, external shading that means not all the area of the window will be exposed to solar radiation part of it is exposed and part of it will be in shade okay so this will have a bearing on the uh, heat transfer to the building okay so let us see what is the effect of this the solar radiation incident on a glazed window can be reduced considerably by using external shadings for example overhangs of course the external shading can also be provided by let us say a tree or an adjacent building right so but uh, here i am uh, assuming that uh, it is based on the overhangs okay so by proper design of the overhangs it is possible to block the solar radiation during summer and allow it into the building during winter okay thereby you can reduce the cooling load and also the heating load so what is the effect of overhangs as we know that overhangs reduce the area of the window exposed to solar radiation and thereby reduce the heat transmission into the building due to direct radiation okay let me show this so this is the window okay the window has the dimensions of height h and uh, width w so area of the window is given by h into w right and area exposed to solar radiation is equal to this without overhang okay because the entire area is exposed to solar radiation but if i am using a overhang with inset let us say i am using an overhang with inset this is the overhang with inset the red uh, hatch portion so you have the uh, certain uh, uh, length of it certain it has certain uh, width and it has certain depth okay depth of the inset is this okay and uh, width is this right so if you are uh, using an overhang you find that uh, this hatched area at this particular incident when the sun is at this particular position this area is not exposed to direct radiation that means this is in shade okay only this much area is exposed to solar radiation okay that means without uh, um, uh, overhang the entire area is exposed to direct radiation whereas with uh, overhang only the small portion is exposed to direct radiation and this small portion is given here as multiplication of x into y okay and at any point you can calculate x and y because this is related to your solar geometry for example this is related to your altitude angle beta and it's also related to your surface uh, azimuth angle uh, surface solar azimuth angle alpha okay what is the relation you can find that at any point uh, x is given by this relation x is equal to w minus d into tan alpha whereas y is equal to h minus d into tan beta by cos alpha as i said beta is your altitude angle alpha is your wall solar azimuth angle whereas w is the width of the window which is equal to the width of the overhang and d is the depth of the inset that means this uh, uh, this dimension okay so if you know the uh, dimensions of the overhang what is the width of it uh, what is the depth of the inset and uh, if you want to find out at any particular incident how much area of the window is shaded how much area of the window is exposed then you can calculate it very easily if you can calculate the uh, altitude and uh, wall solar azimuth angles okay let me give a small example here we have to calculate the energy transmitted into a building at 3 pm okay on july 21st due to solar radiation through a southwest facing window made of regular single glass okay that means it's made of the reference glass the dimensions of the window are uh, height is 2 meters and width is 1.5 meters and the depth of the inset d is 0.3 meters okay now from the given data that means at 3 pm uh, that means our angle is 45 degrees july 21st you can calculate what is the uh, declination on july 21st and uh, it is facing southwest so your uh, zeta is 45 degrees okay so from the hour angle zeta and declination you can calculate the altitude angle and if you do the calculation you will find that the altitude angle works out to be 48.23 degrees 
Okay. Similarly, you can also calculate the surface uh, solar azimuth angle which uh, works out to be 39.8 degrees. So, this is the first step you have to calculate these angles. Once you calculate these angles, uh, you can calculate the dimensions x and y. Okay. x and y is uh, the length and height of the unexposed area. I am sorry uh, of the exposed area right. So, x is given as w minus d into tan alpha where w is the width of the window which is given as 1.5 meter okay and d is the depth of the insert that is given as 0.3 okay. So, you find that x is equal to 1.249 meters and y is equal to h minus d into tan beta by cos alpha where h is 2 meters d is 0.3, tan beta is 48.23 and the alpha is 39.487. So, if you substitute these values you find that y is equal to 1.562. Okay. So, now you can calculate what is the uh, uh, transmitted uh, energy because of solar radiation. So, that is now uh, given by FHGF max multiplied by the shading coefficient multiplied by the exposed area. Okay. So, exposed area is x into y. So, that is given by 1.249 into 1.562 okay, this multiplied by this and SHGF max from your ash table uh, works out to be 230 watt per meter square okay, because this is a 32 degree north latitude okay. and uh, the shading coefficient is 1, shading coefficient is 1 because this is a standard glass. So, you find that the radiation transmitted is 448.7 watts. Okay. If you do not use the overhang, you will find that uh, the energy transmitted is W into H into SHGF max that is 690 watts. Okay. So, you can see that with the overhang it is about 449, with uh, without overhang it is 690. So, there is a considerable reduction in the energy transmitted to the into the building because of the uh, absence of overhang. Okay. So, overhang is beneficial. right? Now, complete shading of the window in summer and complete unshading in winter is possible using separation between the top of the window and overhang. Okay. So, we ideally we would like to completely shade it in uh, summer because we do not want any heat in summer whereas, we want lot of heat in winter. So, you want complete unshading. Okay. So, complete shading and unshading uh, is possible using what is known as a separation. Separation is nothing but the distance between the top of the window and the overhang and an infinite combinations of overhang width. Uh, and separation dimensions can provide complete shading in summer and complete unshading in winter. Okay. So, let me show this. Okay. One thing I would like to mention here is that uh, the position of the sun will, will be varying continuously. Okay. So, when I am saying that this overhang can completely shade this window, it can only completely shade at a particular point. Okay. It cannot completely shade all the time right because the position of the sun varies continuously. So, normally what you have to do is you have to find out the point at which the load is likely to be peak okay, and the design overhang in such a way that during summer uh, the window is completely shaded at this particular instant okay, uh, and during winter it is completely unshaded. So, this is one thing you must remember. Again uh, all these dimensions and all will be varying. Uh, between latitude to latitude because the solar geometry is varying from latitude to latitude and it also varies from the orientation to orientation. Okay. So, these things again you have to keep in mind. Now, you can see from this figure that uh, suppose you have this dimension uh, w naught and uh, this is what is known as separation. Okay. So, this is your window. Uh, if you provide this separation and this much uh, width of the overhang because this is your overhang. Right. You can completely shade this window because the sunlight is falling at this point. So, the entire uh, portion, this entire thing is in shade, okay. whereas the whatever is below this uh, is unshaded. So, no solar radiation is entering into the indoors which are on this side. Right. Uh, if you take this W naught and this S, you can also take for example, this W naught okay, and uh, this S. Then also you can completely shade the window or you can take this W naught and this is okay. Again you can completely shade the uh, window that means uh, a large number of combinations of W naught and S are possible uh, which can result in the complete shading or unshading of the window. Okay. Of course, there are certain limitations of uh, fixed overhang. So far we have been discussing about uh, fixed overhang, it, they have certain limitations. What are the limitations? Uh, any overhang provides protection against 
direct solar radiation only okay it cannot provide any protection against diffuse or reflected radiation and you find that because of the variation of the transmittivity with incident angle during the peak summer time you find that for a vertical surface only about 40 percent of the total uh, solar radiation consists of the contribution of direct uh, radiation okay that means about 40 percent of the total during summer is because of the direct solar radiation and uh, provision of overhang can only reduce this right that means it can only handle the 40 percent rest 60 percent cannot be handled by the overhang because the rest 60 percent consists of diffuse as well as reflected radiation and uh, a overhang cannot uh, reduce diffuse and uh, reflected radiations okay external over, um, uh, shading right and you find that sometimes overhang can work in a negative manner for example the overhang may actually reflect the ground radiation onto the windows right so it is a bit uh, it may look like a paradox that uh, you provide an overhang you find that there is more heat in the room okay this happens because if your ground is highly reflective right then uh, first the radiation will be reflected from the ground onto the overhang and from the overhang onto the wall onto the window right so ultimately because of these reflections uh, uh, you will find that there is a lot of radiation entering into the building not through direct radiation but through reflected radiation okay then overhang is working in a negative manner okay so this is one of the limitations of the fixed overhang and during mornings and evenings when the sun is so low in the sky uh, that overhangs can provide only minimum protection okay so they are not uh, really very useful uh, during mornings and evenings and overhangs are truly effective for windows facing uh, 30 to 45 degrees of south okay so overhangs are not very useful on uh, east and west direction for example why because during e on east and west direction uh, the maximum radiation occurs during morning for east and uh, during evening for west and during mo uh, morning for east and during evening for west uh, the position of the sun is very low right when the position is uh, of the sun is very low that means the altitude angle is very low the overhang cannot uh, block the direct radiation okay so it is not of no use the only way of blocking uh, solar radiation uh, on east and west faces during morning and evening is to use something else like a wall or a uh, tree or an adjacent building right but not overhang this is the another limitation of overhang right in spite of all these limitations overhangs are very widely used because they also provide protection against rain okay so overhangs are highly recommended okay so this is as far as uh, the effect of uh, solar radiation and how to calculate uh, the cooling and heating loads uh, this uh, requires a little bit of extension but how to calculate the energy transmitted into the building due to solar radiation first through opaque surfaces and the next through transparent surface again the, for the transparent surfaces with and without external shading okay so from the discussion we can calculate all these things now let us look at uh, another aspect of cooling and heating load calculation that is ventilation and infiltration air inside a space uh, sh uh, okay uh, should be pure to ensure healthy and comfortable living conditions However, conditioned air normally consists of several pollutants. Okay, what are these pollutants? These pollutants are odors, various gases such as carbon dioxide and uh, uh, volatile organic compounds or VOCs and particulate matter. Okay, so you find that any conditioned space uh, will not be 100% pure, but it will consist of these impurities. And if these impurities, if the concentration of these impurities goes beyond a certain level, you find that the indoor environment is not, uh, neither it is healthy nor it is comfortable for the occupants okay so these pollutants are due to both internal as well as external sources internal sources are uh, human beings appliances etc whereas the external sources are the outside air itself and indoor air quality uh, the abbreviation is iaq can be controlled by the removal of the contaminants in the air uh, or by diluting the air that means you can maintain the purity of the air inside a conditioned space either by removing the contaminants or by diluting the air okay there are uh, you can use the both of these techniques now with reference to this indoor air quality what is ventilation and what is the purpose of ventilation the purpose of ventilation is to dilute the air inside the conditioned space okay thereby maintain required indoor air quality and uh, ventilation is defined as the supply of fresh air to the conditioned space 
either by natural or by mechanical means for the purpose of maintaining acceptable indoor air quality. Okay, so the whole purpose of ventilation is to maintain required uh, indoor air quality which is very much essential for a uh, comfortable and healthy uh, living conditions and uh, this consists of supplying uh, uh, fresh air and either by natural means that means either by natural ventilation or by mechanical means that means either by using an exhaust fans or blowers etc. Okay, this is the definition of ventilation and ventilation air generally comprises of fresh outdoor air and some amount of recirculated air that is treated to maintain acceptable indoor air quality. Okay. So, the ventilation air need not be all outdoor air, it can be a part of uh, outdoor air and some part of it can be recirculated. When you are using recirculated air for ventilation purpose, you have to treat it first then use it for ventilation. Okay. And if the outdoor air is not pure, that means outdoor air itself is dirty, it consists of lot of dust, then it also has got to be treated before supplying to the space. Though the amount of fresh air required for breathing is quite small, that means its uh, amount of fresh air required is about 0.2 liter per second per person from uh, breathing uh, point of view. The actual requirement of fresh air is large as ventilation air in addition to providing oxygen for breathing also has to serve the following purposes. Okay. So, only one of the purpose of ventilation is to provide oxygen. In addition to providing oxygen, a ventilation air also has to dilute the orders inside the occupied space. This is very important to a socially acceptable level. Okay. So, order dilution is an uh, important function of ventilation. Second important function is to maintain the carbon dioxide concentration at a satisfactory level. And the third uh, practical uh, requirement is that it should be able to pressurize the escape routes in the event of fire. Okay, so, these are the other uh, important uh, functions of ventilation air. Estimate, let us look at the estimation of minimum outdoor air required for ventilation. How do we find how much air is required for ventilation? From energy conservation of point of view, it is important to choose the ventilation requirement suitably as ventilation is one of the major components of system loads. Okay, so, it is very important to choose it properly. You cannot have lot of ventilated air, then you will have to pay in terms of running cost. The amount of air required for ventilation purposes depends on several factors such as application, activity level, extent of cigarette smoking, etc. So, several factors affect the amount of required air. Okay. And based on several studies extending over several years, uh, guidelines for minimum ventilation requirements have been established. For example, one of the guidelines is ASHRAE standard 62 bar uh, 1989. Let me give a small example of this ASHRAE standard. What does it say? Well, this is a typical uh, outdoor air requirements for, for ventilation adapted from uh, ASHRAE standards. You can see that for offices, uh, if the occupancy level is 7 people for 100 meter square floor area and uh, if it is a smoking zone, you require 10 liter per second per person. Okay. And if it is a non-smoking zone, you require 2.5 liter per second per person. Okay. And for operation theatres, you require high levels of uh, ventilation and the occupancy will be 20 uh, persons per 100 meter square and normally smoking is not allowed, but still you require high uh, ventilation air because you have to maintain high level of purity. And for lobbies, uh, where the occupancy is slightly higher, 30 persons per 100 meter square floor area and if smoking is allowed, you require about 7.5 uh, liter per second per person and if smoking is not there, then 2.5 liter per second. And for classrooms, for example, where the occupancy is still higher, 100 uh, persons per uh, 50 persons per 100 meter square floor area and normally smoking is not allowed and the required ventilation is 8 liter per second per person. Okay. And for meeting places, these are the values. So, one thing you can notice here is that uh, as the occupancy level increases, uh, the required amount of uh, outdoor air or uh, increases. Similarly, if you are allowing smoking, then outdoor air also requirement also increases. Okay. So, based on if you have this kind of data, you can uh, decide what is the uh, outdoor air requirement. Let us see how to estimate infiltration. Now, so, so far I have been discussing about ventilation and let us see what is infiltration and how to estimate uh, infiltration loads. First of all, infiltration, it is defined as the uncontrolled entry of untreated outdoor air directly into the conditioned space. Okay. So, you have to carefully note the difference between infiltration and ventilation. Both involve uh, supply of outdoor air, whereas ventilated air is in a uh, supplied in a controlled manner, infiltration is uncontrolled entry. Okay, so, you have no control on that. And infiltration of outdoor air 
or takes place because of two effects one is what is known as wind effect and the other one is what is known as stack effect. As the name implies the wind effect means infiltration due to the wind blowing over the building. So whenever wind blows over the building pressure differences are created because of these pressure differences outside air enters into the building and uh, the air from the building leaves the uh, building okay. This is what is known as wind effect and the second effect is what is known as stack effect. This is nothing but the entry of outdoor air because of the buoyancy effect. So the buoyancy effect is created because of the temperature difference between the inside and outside. Whether it is summer or winter the inside temperature will be different from the outside temperature. So you have a some te temperature difference. So because of this temperature difference there will be some density differences between the outside air and inside air. And if your building has some openings because of the density differences there will be uh, uh, by entry of outdoor air into the building and some amount of uh, or the same amount of air leaves the building okay. So this is what is known as stack effect. In commercial buildings uh, even though infiltration supplies outdoor air in commercial buildings efforts are made to minimize infiltration because it is uncontrolled and unreliable. So you cannot make any design uh, depending upon infiltration because it uh, depends upon unreliable factors such as wind and stack okay. So generally it is reduced and so what are the measures to reduce this? These measures as you know very well are the use of vestibules or revolving doors, use of air curtains, uh, building pressurization. If you uh, pressurize the building and if the inside pressure is higher than the outside pressure no outdoor air can enter. So thereby you can reduce uh, infiltration and you can also use proper sealing of doors, windows etc. thereby you can reduce the infiltration loads. Now the estimation of the exact amount of infiltration is very difficult as it depends on several factors such as the type and age of the building, indoor and outdoor air conditions, outdoor uh, outside wind velocity and direction etc. Okay. So analytical estimation is very difficult. There are several methods are used, one method is what is known as uh, uh, air changes per hour. In this method depending upon the building type whether it is a loose building, medium building or tight building infiltrate, uh, infiltration rates are specified are related empirically to wind velocity and temperature difference. So if you know the wind velocity and temperature difference using the empirical equations you can calculate the uh, infiltration rates. And data is also available for uh, infiltration rate through different types of windows, doors, etc. Okay, now let us look at heating and low, cooling loads due to ventilation and infiltration. Due to ventilation and infiltration buildings gain sensible and latent energy in summer and lose sensible and latent energy in winter. So you have to note here that the energy transfer is both in the form of sensible as well as latent modes okay and the energy is gained in summer and it is lost in winter and the sensible and latent heat transfer rates are simply given by uh, Q sensible is M dot Cp into delta T which is uh, you can write in terms of volumetric flow rate that is V naught into density in Cp and uh, latent heat transfer rate that is uh, this. Okay, here HFG is the latent heat of uh, vaporization, M dot O is the air flow rate due to infiltration or ventilation and WO and WI are outside moisture content and inside moisture content and T naught and TI are the outside drivable temperature and inside drivable temperature and as I have written here M dot and V dot are mass and volumetric flow rates due to infiltration and ventilation. So if you know the infiltration ventilation rates and outdoor and indoor condition you can calculate what is the sensible heat transfer because of uh, ventilation, because of uh, ventilation and infiltration, what is the latent heat transfer rate because of uh, infiltration and ventilation, okay. So that is how you can calculate but one of the major uh, difficulties is to find out the uh, infiltration rates, okay. At this point I stop this lecture and we will continue this uh, discussion in the next lecture, thank you.